Tommy Regretti, the new character of Vice City. Oh my god, there is so much mental illness in the games industry, just reading it makes me feel like I'm losing my hair. Hi, welcome back to the Leering Locust Comey and Gold, a weekly news roundup where I... As you can tell, I'm Locus. I'm a lifelong gamer. Yeah, your girlfriend's Final Fantasy, and according to you guys, an Alexander Volkanovsky look-alike. The, the new cut is definitely not because I got a hair transplant, I swear. Ubisoft, which is now widely regarded as the closest thing to a corporation lolcow, just keeps on unraveling in its missteps. Remember our good friend Eve Guillemot, the guy embroiled in such a public corporate scandal? If you don't, I suggest you check out the last two weeks roundups linked in the cards. Well, apparently self-awareness is completely lost on him. And speaking at a recent interview conference, he was quoted in saying, In today's challenging market, and with gamers expecting extraordinary experiences, delivering solid quality is no longer enough. Solid is an interesting choice of words to use, Racer X. Can you read me all the definitions of literal slop? Uh, spilled or splash liquid, soft mud or slush, or unappetizing watery food or soup. You can literally go into any district affected by Montezuma's revenge, stare into any of the unflushed toilet bowls, and find material more solid than what Ubisoft has been putting out. <coughs> From the deceptive wording, it looks as though that he's trying to blame the fact that gamers have high standards and their immune systems are beginning to reject the garbage being injected into their consoles. Is this the conclusion of Ubisoft's board of directors internal review? Eve, brother, by your own company's admission, in the PR update that you guys released, it said that you guys felt as though that the post Star Wars outlaws needed some polishing. Here's a direct quote from the memo. Assassin's Creed Shadows will now be released 14th February, 2025. While the game is feature complete, the learnings from Star Wars outlaws release led us to provide additional time to further polish the title. That is corporate speak for we fucked up. Now, Endymion recently released a video in where he leaks information given to him from a supposed source within Ubisoft. And if it's true, this is some juicy stuff. I heard a rumor. If you haven't watched Endymion's video, I would highly suggest that you watch it for the full scoop, but there are some really important points that I feel need to be hammered here. Some of the most notable points, which don't surprise me, are that after the George Floyd BLM riots, Ubisoft, who initially were going to feature a male, Japanese protagonist in Assassin's Creed Shadows got a little glint of green in their eyes and decided to upgrade from a traditional samurai to legendary and potentially fabled samurai Yasuke. The next point is Ubisoft was horrified off the overall reception to Yasuke because they're so hip and thought that putting a hip hop soundtrack in a game that takes place centuries ago in Japan was a really good idea. Kids, kids, kids. Listen to the rap music. Which is now going to be removed. But here are one of the two points that you should really be focusing on. The first one being the money. Ubisoft is apparently in dire straits, not due to the reception of Assassin's Creed Shadows or Star Wars Outlaws, but what really reduced the company to Skull and Bones was their game Skull and Bones, which supposedly costed 600 to 850 million dollars to make and about 10 years of development. Apparently, every playtest of the game was basically a different game every single time. I've been looking around for sales numbers for Skull and Bones, but they don't really seem readily available, which is suspicious in itself. Apparently on debut, the player count on Steam was 850,000 people, which was seemingly bolstered by the eight hour free trial of the game. The only hint at poor sales I was able to find is that the game, which Eve tried justifying a $70 price tag for, was being sold at Best Buy on a sale for $10. But the second point is what gamers need to be incredibly vigilant about. Apparently, moving forward, not just Ubisoft, but game companies in general, they won't be overtly advertising DEI elements into their games as a plus. So it looks like they finally got the memo. You know, the one where a majority of gamers collectively said, eh, nah, we're good, thanks. But do you think that stopped them? Not a chance. If these rumors are true, these sly foxes are now playing dirty, slipping those unwanted features into your games, like roofies into your girlfriend's drink at the club, they're banking on you and her, sipping on that digital cocktail without noticing the bitter legendary samurai twist. <laughs> to my estimation, this absolves companies from taking any sort of responsibility and opens the door to allow them to utilize more gaslighting against the customers. What would that include? The slow erasure of males 
as main protagonists, which by the way, according to the rumors, white men were actually contracted to make the game actually functional, the dilution of heterosexuality and the uglification of women all over. So what are you guys gonna do? Are you gonna speak up and voice your discontent when the powers that be tell you that you're a chud flexing on phantoms, or are you going to let this play out and hope for the best? Let me know in the comments. Ubisoft isn't exactly off the hook yet. If you thought the developer's troubles were just about a delayed game, buckle up. There is an activist investor, AG Investments, with less than 1% stake that are not merely asking for a change in recipe. They're suggesting that Ubisoft should just sell itself off to a private equity, or maybe even Tencent, who already have a big slice of the Ubisoft pie. Remember, Tencent, the company that we talked about last week that gave Remedy that huge loan? Well, hot damn! Sounds like they uh, got their tentacles in a bunch of other companies that are struggling to keep their head above water. But it ain't just deep sea monsters that are giving the company trouble. It's the employees. Ubisoft is facing strike action in France over their return to office mandate, which in the grand scheme of things might seem trivial, but in the context of Ubisoft's operational hiccup, it's like adding a pinch of salt to the wound. Who's going to polish Star Wars Outlaws now? Ain't that too bad? It doesn't end there. Reports are swirling that Ubisoft has been waving off legitimate criticism as mere quote-unquote toxic gamer talk. Imagine that. Your player base tries to give you feedback and instead of listening, the company's like, <laughs> they're just haters. Meanwhile, the DEI policies or the lack of effective implementation have reportedly led to what insiders are calling quote unquote brain drain. That's right, talent are walking out of the door because they're either not feeling the inclusive vibe or the company not backing up the talk with action. This is corroborated by a post by the monetization director of Ubisoft taking to social media to, as Grums put it, simultaneously trying to cancel fellow devs, silence them for being quote unquote, non-decent human beings, if they disagree, while gaslighting and blaming gamers for the hate. Sometimes you got to wonder if these people are self-aware at all. Ubisoft is collapsing. This is not death by a thousand cuts. This is death by a thousand cannonballs in their mouth. All right, folks, gather around because we got some real talk straight from the Cyberpunk 2077 director's mouth. CD Projekt Red, the folks that brought us the game that promised to redefine the genre, but instead crash landed into a reputation nightmare are now admitting that their image might never fully scrub from the mess that was Cyberpunk 2077's launch. But we're talking about a game so buggy, it could have been mistaken for a new species of tropical insect. Now, after what seemed like an eternity of patching, praying, and hoping, they managed to turn Cyberpunk into something actually playable, even enjoyable, especially with the Phantom Liberty expansion. But even with all that hard work, the director is throwing his hands up saying, yeah, we might never get our old rep back. So what's next for CD Projekt Red? Well, they're now rolling over. Like a boxer who got knocked out cold, coming back into the ring promising a knockout, they're doubling down on their future projects like The Witcher 4 and a new IP called Hater. Hadar. The basic gist of what they're saying is, we've learned our lesson, now watch us. Will fans forget? Probably not entirely, but they might give them another chance out of sheer curiosity or nostalgia for what CD Projekt Red once represented. As someone who initially noped out of Cyberpunk 2077 when an incredibly dramatic and pivotal death scene was tarnished by a bug that had a gun protruding out of the head of the character that was dying, I uh, later came back to the game post-patch and enjoyed it so much that I got the platinum trophy. So here's to hoping CD Projekt Red can make good on their declarations. All right, guys, do you ever get tired of uh, news about mentally ill people internally sabotaging a company with their politics? You do? Well, too bad. Here's news on Godot, the game engine company you had no idea about until now. Okay, so do you guys remember Main Quest, that dumb story last week with the horse pronouns? I thought the story would end there, but get ready. It just opened up a can of highly regarded worms. That's, that's me censoring myself, by the way. So, in a reply to Alice Rupert, a small Twitter account adding to another rude reply stated, it makes sense, doesn't it? Woke Studios will always use pre-built engines to make games because they can't build their own engines. A tweet which had eight likes at the time and has 15 at the time of filming this video, not a big deal. Well, whoever was running the Godot account saw the tweet that was completely unrelated felt like it was ruining their day and saw an opportunity to own the chuds. And forged a new tweet saying, apparently game engines are woke now. Well then, we won't complain. Show us your hashtag, Wokot Games below. Wokot. Wokot, really. 
At least try doing some decent wordplay, Gen Z. The, the woke overrides the Godot to the point where Godot is completely lost. It's lazy, I'm being petty, but there's a very clear metaphor going on here. Well, it didn't take long for people to suggest to the open source company that perhaps staying out of politics would be for the best, but that didn't matter. Titanium backer, blocked. Bisex, blocked. In other words, we were dealing with a mentally unhinged person surfing on a power trip. Blocking your backers, solid move. Solid business move. So, so, so solid. Solid like those Ubisoft titles. Solid Snake. Take notes. Wait, what? They weren't just blocking them on Twitter. GitHub as well. Oh man, you gotta give it up to these guys. I've never seen such commitment to drilling your head into the goddamn sand. Godot, amidst the controversy, essentially put out a statement in an act of supreme confidence, locked the replies on Twitter, and basically sidestepped any sort of accountability of bad behavior, and throwing their Discord community, Xanananex, under the bus. He must have been on Xanix when he typed that name. <laughs> and at least tonally, they didn't fully admonish his behavior. What sort of stuff did this Xanonex guy say, by the way? Well, there's this thing of him basically reacting to the Twitter drama that took place, and I quote, You have no right of speech here, because I consider your speech to be toxic vomit. If you think inviting queer people to share your games is politics, you are a toxic piece of f off, an evil human, and I want you to feel disrespected and f off as fast as you can. Racer X, correct me if I'm wrong, but toxic piece of f off could be potentially construed as a compliment? There is absolutely no way that this guy had no skeletons in his closet. Right? Right, guys? Behold, Racer X! My emerald tablets! My wonder emporium of bigotry! I feel given my lineage, I can say a lot of these slurs, but I don't want to twist the nips of the YouTube algorithm. Then you have the other community manager states, I've given up. I've started a folder of the silliest replies I see when moderating. No clue what to do with that collection of brain rot yet, but I'll figure out something eventually. It didn't take long before Redot, the fork for Godot, to basically say that they were going to make good on the promises of Godot, presumably without any of the political biases. In a tweet, they stated, Redot Engine is a new open source fork of Godot with the goal of fulfilling the promise of Godot. We will be having a small space on Friday, October 4th, 2024, time to be determined to formally launch. Share this and let us know what you want to see us cover. Throughout the whole debacle, the creator of Godot was very quiet. Too quiet. Almost as though that he was tacitly approving of the messaging of Godot's Twitter account. Well, he decided to break his silence on X alternative Macedon in where he stated, we'll chill from Twitter slash X until after the US elections. Almost all the hate Godot got over the weekend was pretty much people who had not a clue what a game engine is. Well, what Godot is, or what a FOSS community made project is. Most of the ones who did were the usual haters. Checking profile of haters, majority pro-Trump people with weird religious symbology or people with avatars slash obsession for anime little girls. And then he says, sometimes I feel I am too innocent for this world. Well, I gotta hand it to him. I didn't know what Godot was till this whole ordeal and against my own will, now I do. I don't know why you would listen to me, but if you want to veer away from politics injected into your open source engines, I'm going to suggest Redot now. <laughs> hey guys, ever wonder if the translations you're getting for your anime and video games are entirely accurate? Have you ever gotten a whiff of out of place social justice activism in your video games about slaying zombies? Well, I'm here to tell you that sometimes you gotta trust that nose of yours. I'm going to preface this with, do not contact this person, leave her alone. But meet Katrina. According to her Twitter post, she is a professional translator and localization expert, specializes in everything audiovisual, movies, TV, games, anime, manga, and more. When asked about her intention with her uh, very liberal translations, Katrina replied with, this may surprise you, but I love the material, and two, the translation is not for you. Heart emoji. Translation, you are not the intended audience. So I guess it's not the creator of the work that determines the intended audience, it's the localizers? <laughs> I've got so many things to say to you in Japanese, but I don't want YouTube to smite me, so consider yourself lucky. <laughs> but if you're like me and know Japanese and recognize the translation is off, here's her dismissing your concerns while implying your Japanese is rudimentary, you can't understand colloquialisms, and saying, leave it to the professionals, while she 
goes off and partakes in incredibly unprofessional behavior. Not only that, but when you're subtitling, everybody can hear what they're saying. And you have a lot of people, especially young people like millennials and Gen Z who got really into Japanese through anime. So they started learning a little bit of Japanese. So they are very loud on social media when they hear something and they're like, wait, that's not what the subtitle said. These people don't know what they're doing. And it's like, no, you guys like, you know, this is, this is a skilled profession. We know what we're doing. We didn't change it to spite you in your Japanese one-on-one class. Like this is actually what they said. You just don't understand the whole, the challenges of it. Can't she translate this? I'm sorry. This localization garbage has been happening for so long. And to be completely honest, it's one of the things that grinds my gears the most. And you know what? I'm guessing that it's also grinding the gears of Yuji Hoodie, the creator of Dragon Quest. In a video from Tokyo Game Show 2024, he laments the restrictions American quote-unquote values imposes onto Japanese companies, causing them to censor. It didn't take long to start using verbiage to describe the situation that would help JRPG players comprehend. He says, under the name of compliance, it's an absolute god an evil disguised as good. Then he goes on to say, there is a religious concept in the West, especially in America, that influences their approach to sex education, right? Their approach to compliance is very narrow-minded. He further laments not being able to choose between a man and a woman in Dragon Quest anymore and having to label them type one and type two while he's wondering who's really complaining about this. Well, maybe someone should introduce him to Katrina and those of her ilk. He stated that it's really frustrating doing business with such a ridiculous country. Do you remember a time when Japan used to look up to America? You know, around the 80s, 90s, early aughts, 2015, dude, even up until pretty recently, you know? They, they would adopt our subcultures, which you have to have deep reverence for the culture that you adopt the subculture from. You know, the, the Americana of rockabilly, that still exists in Japan. Look at us now, Razor X. The West is so far fallen. This is embarrassing. The interview actually got so much traction that the X-Man himself, no, not DMX, he's unfortunately dead, Elon Musk retweeted the interview not adding much commentary, but the obvious, this is insane. Well, that's what's going on with Dragon Quest. What's going on with that other mega JRPG franchise? Oh, what's this? Yoshi P, the master behind Final Fantasy XIV, has thrown a curveball into the rumor mill about Final Fantasy IX Remake. Apparently, he fears as though that the long rumored remake will not be able to fit into one entry, hinting that they may expand on the world. Which makes me scratch my head, because I think Square ultimately realized with the Final Fantasy VII Remake sales that splitting the games may not be the best idea. He states that there is too much volume in the game, and to that I say, just cut some of the useless shit out and just streamline the good stuff. Am I the only one that thought Final Fantasy VII Rebirth had way too much redundant content going on for it? Uh, leave your thoughts in the comments. Tim Sweeney, the big boss at Epic Games, just dropped a truth bomb at Unreal Fest. He's basically saying, the big chunky AA titles with uh, budgets that could probably fund a small country, they're not exactly hitting the mark. Or in terms of Ubisoft, solid games. People are throwing millions at these games and they're not really selling the way that they used to. Why? Because apparently gamers these days are about that social life. They just want to hang out in Roblox and Fortnite, where it's not just the game, it's a soiree. Brands are jumping in. It's like a digital party where Disney and Star Wars are your next door neighbors. And if that's the case, I'd like to move to a new neighborhood, please. Now let's talk about Fortnite for a second. Sweeney, more than tooting his own horn, states that Fortnite is not just surviving, it's thriving with a record-breaking 110 million monthly players. That's not just numbers. That's a movement towards what he calls the metaverse. This idea that games are becoming these massive interconnected social spaces. Sweeney isn't here just to talk about Fortnite's wins. Old boy got beef with Apple and Google, accusing them of stifling this new gaming renaissance with their app store policies claiming, these guys are blocking the future with their greedy restrictive practices. Are you ready for the Fortnite phone racer X? Ah, uh, the saga at Activision Blizzard continues to unfold like a Shakespearean tragedy, only with less iambic pentameter and more corporate layoffs. Here's a scoop straight from the digital streets. Activision Blizzard. Say hi, Doge. Activision Blizzard, the folks behind Overwatch 2, decided to give nearly 400 employees old heave-ho. Why, you may ask? Well, it's part of the Microsoft grand plan after they shelled out a cool $69 billion to buy Activision Blizzard, making it the biggest video game industry acquisition ever. But remember, with great acquisition comes great responsibility and layoffs apparently. Microsoft in their infinite wisdom or perhaps their quest for gaming dominance snapped up Activision Blizzard. They promised 
a new dawn, a brighter future. And then, oops, we've got a little too many cooks in the kitchen. Those that got snipped include 140 jobs from Activision Blizzard's Irvine, California headquarters, 110 jobs from their Santa Monica office, and 143 jobs from their Playa Vista location. That's, that, that's right by us, Racer X. Tell them to keep those pruning saws away from me. Those teams this affects the most are the Overwatch 2 and Diablo 4 teams. They apparently need to quote unquote align their teams post acquisition. Translation, we've got a lot of people doing the same job now. Let's streamline. This isn't just an Activision Blizzard or Microsoft thing. The video game industry is going through a brutal phase with layoffs everywhere. All right, time to aim our crosshairs at Microsoft. Tango Gameworks was crafting the sequel to the critically acclaimed Hi-Fi Rush, tentatively titled Hi-Fi Rush 2, and was doing some Evil Within anniversary stuff before Microsoft pulled the plug. Hi-Fi Rush 2 apparently had a six month build before Tango got the ax. Crafton swooped in, grabbed Hi-Fi Rush, but uh, Evil Within, that's uh, still Microsoft's. What's next? Who knows, but keep your eyes on this space. Well, apparently Bethesda dropped some Starfield DLC titled Shattered Space. And I could probably count on one finger how many people actually care. Shattered Space, more like Shattered Faith. Oh gamers, gather around for some pretty sad news from the world of Bloodstained. Shutoro Ida, the mastermind behind Bloodstained, Ritual of the Night has announced he's stepping back from the sequel due to a cancer diagnosis. Yep, you heard that right. The guy that brought us the most anticipated spiritual successors to Castlevania is taking a bow, not because he wants to, but because life, as it does, threw a curveball. Now, Ida did not just drop this bomb and leave us hanging. He shared that he's already laid down groundwork for Bloodstain 2, tossing ideas around before this hell scare. But now, the torch is being passed, and while we wish him nothing but the best in his recovery, there's this palpable sense of what could have been hanging over the problem. Project. It's like watching your favorite band break up just before their comeback album. The gaming community's reaction, it's a mix of support for Ida and a touch of anxiety for the sequel's future. Will it capture the same magic without Ida at the helm? Only time will tell, but for now, let's hope for his swift recovery and maybe, just maybe, his triumphant return. After all, in the world of gaming, as in life, it's not about the destination, but the journey. And right now, our journey with Bloodstain has hit a poignant pause. Ah, God, that's enough Gomi for the day. Let's talk about some neutral news. Hironobu Sakaguchi claims that he cheated on Nintendo when he took Final Fantasy over to PlayStation. He's quoted in saying, I look back at my career and I really got a huge part of my start from the NES and Nintendo. So without NES, I would say none of this would have actually been possible. But then, you know, I cheated on it. <laughs> but then, you know, I, uh cheated on Nintendo and went to PlayStation, but whether it was Nintendo or Sony, I think both those companies, in addition to Final Fantasy, kind of represent a lot of my origin story in terms of my career development. Noriaki Okamura, the guy behind the contemporary Metal Gear Solid series, has dropped some info that's hotter than Ubisoft's pants when they make a press statement. He's basically saying if they decide to remake classics like Metal Gear Solid 1 or Metal Gear Solid 2, they can't just slap a new coat of paint on them. No, they have to rebuild it from the ground up, adding all sorts of new goodies. They're noodling on what's next for the series, but they're waiting to see how fans react to Metal Gear Solid Delta first. Why? Because in Okamura's words, before the original crew checks out, they've got to lay down the legacy, a path for Metal Gear Solid that stretches out 10 to even maybe 50 years. Rick and Morty forever and forever 100 years, Rick and Morty some things. So are we looking at a future where Metal Gear isn't just remembered, but lives on in new wild ways? Leave your thoughts down in the comments. Guerrilla Games, the creators behind Horizon, are diving headfirst into the live service model with Horizon Online as their next big project, pushing the anticipated Horizon 3 further into the future. This shift towards online gameplay amidst Sony's broader push for live services reflects the industry's trend towards ongoing game worlds over traditional sequels. While fans might be buzzing with anticipation or concern for this new direction, Guerrilla's move could either redefine the franchise's success or highlight the risks of pivoting from a beloved single player narrative to a multiplayer focused ecosystem. The real question remains, can Guerrilla Games strike the right balance or will this be another lesson in the volatile world of live service gaming? All right, let's talk some gold, shall we? It's not all doom and gloom for Ubisoft after all. Assassin's Creed Shadows, which recently felt the bittersweet taste of delay, is getting a co-op mode. While very little is known about it at the very moment, the co-op mode will see Naoe and Yasuke fight together using different combat abilities to take out enemies. At least in my opinion, co-op is always more fun than a single player experience. 
but you know. That's because I spent a lot of time alone. Are you a fan of cinematic scores? Are you a fan of dragons? Well, guess what? Lorne Balfey, <laughs> I don't even know if I'm saying his name right. And Hans Zimmer will compose a soundtrack for Dragon Age of Elgard. Dragon Age of Elgard was covered in last week's roundup, so be sure to check it out in the cards. Worried about how Metal Gear Solid Delta is going to turn out? Well, hopefully Famitsu's review on Silent Hill 2 Remake will put those fears to rest, since Konami is doing both of them. Famitsu, which takes the average review of four people, gave Silent Hill a 35 out of 40. The game has about a 16 to 18 hour playtime, and the impressions were overall positive. You guys are going to roast me, but I've never played a Silent Hill game in my life. Should I start here? Leave it down in the comments. Maybe I'll be able to stream a playthrough for you guys on my Twitch channel, which will be linked in the description. I'm just glad Konami seems to be getting back on the right track after years. Famitsu also put out another review for Metaphor Refantasio, giving the overall rating a 37 out of 40 stating that the gameplay is similar to Persona and that the coolness of the presentation is on a different level. The game takes about 80 hours to beat with an extra 20 hours of additional side content. And I am officially intrigued. Should I play it for you guys? Leave it down in the comments. We cut this new story from last week because new intel shows that Ruben Langdon, Dante from our beloved Devil May Cry series, has not quit acting. After a full game of telephone, Ruben came to Twitter to make it clear that he is still in the game. Ruben didn't just take an exit stage left from acting, he took a strategic leap to avoid what he called the Biden jab mandates. Yes. You heard that right. He dodged the experimental bioweapon, as he puts it, during those tumultuous times of vaccine mandates. Did you guys dodge what Ruben describes as a bioweapon? Leave it down in the comments. Now, while the rumor mill churns stories of his retirement, Langdon's been quietly waiting for the storm to pass. He's not retired, he's just biding his time, not willing to bend the knee to what he saw as an injustice. So good on him. But here's where it gets juicy, my swarm. While he's been out, Johnny Young Bosch has been stepping into his shoes as Dante in the new Netflix Devil May Cry series. Bosch, by the way, got Langdon's seal of approval, which shows that there's no bad blood, just a man standing by his principles. I actually got to hang out with Ruben during Morphin Con, and let me tell you, the guy is super cool. Without giving away too much of his personal life details, the guy has decided to move off the grid to a magical island. We're glad you're still in the game, my friend. Apparently, Star Wars, in its first month, managed to hit the one million mark in sales. The same number of sales Yakuza, like a dragon infinite wealth, sold in a week. Which means that in the gaming world, Yakuza is bigger than Star Wars. Perhaps Kate Vestis, or whatever her name is, should start taking charisma tips from the Mad Dog of Shimano. This is pure gold. Have you guys felt as though that Helldivers 2, even amidst the rebuffs, needs a real shakeup? Well, rejoice. According to Videogamer.com, our psychic, shield-loving friends, the Illuminate, may be making their official debut in the battle for Super Earth. Now, while we're all speculating, remember, Arrowhead loves their misdirection. They might throw us a curveball and make us fight Illuminate-themed bugs for all we know. But if these leaks are to be believed, and let's be real, there's usually a kernel of truth. We're looking at the Illuminate crashing our party, possibly on Liberty Day, October 26th. That's right. A psychic invasion on the day we're supposed to be celebrating our freedom. Talk about timing, huh? Well, that's a wrap on this week's roundup. Which news makes you want to purchase Viagra? Which news makes you want to exile from society? And what news makes you want to put your pants on and face another day? Leave it down in the comments. I'm Locust. I'll catch you for next week's roundup. Bye-bye.